This is a guide to setting up OctaPrint on two types of Raspberry Pi and OctaLabs to do this. You might have seen those awesome time lapses for 3D prints where the extruder is out of the way and the object magically appears out of nothing. Well, we're going to cover that later in today's video, but for now, let's look at the basics of what OctaPrint is. OctaPrint is a host program, which means it replaces a PC that would traditionally be tethered to your 3D printer. The difference here is that OctaPrint is run wirelessly, which means you connect from any device with the browser on your local network. That includes laptops, tablets, and phones. It doesn't have to end with the local network, however. There's nothing to stop you from setting up OctaPrint so you can check it externally, so you can view and even control your printer while you're not even at home. Imagine the situation where you're running a particularly tricky print that goes for many, many hours, and you'll be able to check on it and cancel it if need be in the first few hours before all the filament is wasted, even if you're at work. Now, it's unusual, but you can run OctaPrint on a PC, Mac, or Linux computer, but commonly it's run on a Raspberry Pi. So in this guide, we're gonna look at installing it on a Model 3B, as well as a Zero Wi-Fi edition. After we've covered those basics, we'll move on to OctaLapse to work out how to do those awesome time lapses. We start by visiting the OctaPrint website, and once you finish reading, you can click the download page, and that will take you to here. If we scroll down the bottom, we will see that you can install it for Linux, Windows, and Mac, but for most people, they do it for Raspberry Pi. And it's as simple as clicking this download button for OctaPi. OctaPi is a special build of Raspbian with OctaPrint on it. And it also has two other dependencies which are key for the operation. So once you download this, you're gonna have a zip file with an image inside of that. Once you've downloaded and unzipped, I highly recommend using Win32 Disk Imager. You simply select the image file and triple check that you have the right device, otherwise it will overwrite anything you have in there. And once you've done that, click write. So after the image is written, you'll have two partitions, one that you can access from Windows and one that you can't. On the one that you can access called boot, there's one file that you should definitely edit and another that you might optionally decide to change. The first one that you definitely should do is this one here and that's to set up the Wi-Fi. Now you need to edit this in a text editor such as Notepad++ and there's only one bit that you really need to change if you have a normal Wi-Fi connection, and that is to uncomment these four lines here, insert your SSID and your password, and then save that file. Now, the other file that I should draw your attention to is this one here, octopi.txt. If we open it up in Notepad++, we can see that there's a whole bunch of options for things like the camera. In the description, I'll have a link to this page, which will explain how this document works, and also this page, which has a bunch of cameras that have been tested by other people and the settings to put in for that. For now, I'm going to leave it as the default, which means this line is commented and therefore it's going to run at 640 by 480 with a frame rate of 10 frames per second. I did experiment later on with upping the resolution and frame rate. The time lapses improved in their quality, but the general latency for monitoring through the webcam was definitely not as good. So we've put the SD card in the Raspberry Pi, we've powered it up and we've visited our router information page to find out its IP address, which we've entered into the browser. And it's gonna run this setup wizard on your first run. So let's take you through this. We have access control and it's strongly recommended that you create a password and a username, of course. And this prevents people from modifying and playing with your printer, especially if you're giving it access from outside your local network. This one just checks that it can connect to the outside world. And you click this button here and it's telling you that it can. That's important for updates. This one will block problematic plugins, so we're going to leave that enabled as well. If you're using the built-in Cura engine to slice STLs, you would import your .ini file here. I use Simplified 3D, so I will not, but it's important that you know that that functionality is available. Here we're going to set up our printer. So I'm doing a Cocoon Create Touch. And fortunately for me, all the defaults actually match the dimensions of my printer. So I'm gonna leave them as is and hit next and then finish. And then the main interface will load and we'll see if it's working. So the first thing we need to do is connect to the printer. So I'm gonna click auto connect. So that happens automatically from now on. I'm gonna hit connect and hopefully we have some good luck. We can see that our state is operational. So I'll power on the main power supply for the printer now. Let's attempt to heat the bed. And we can see the graph updates and we should see our temperature 
slowly slide towards that. The main tab is the control tab and that will show you what the camera is seeing and that happens in real time. And we can control the printer by using these buttons and we can also do that with the keyboard as well by hovering over and then showing up the keyboard shortcuts. So now if I'm hovering over, I can use the keyboard to move around the printer. Really handy functionality. Other things I can do is test the fan is working. On or off, I can heat up from the temperature tab and then load filament with extrusion commands. I can take my feed and flow rates. And if I need to, I can turn the motors off so I can manually move around the printer. We have a G-code viewer if you were doing your slicing with Cura Engine. We have a terminal where we can input commands, send them back and forth, really good for setting calibration. For our first ones, we're gonna do it on Z-Change. Now here's an important point to understand. We can access the files on the SD card of the printer, but we can also upload files to the SD card of the Raspberry Pi. And that is the preferred option and it gives us all the functionality such as the time-lapse. We're gonna upload a cube file which I've created. And all I have to do if I wanna print is hit this print button. So I'm sure you'll agree that getting the basic version of OctaPrint running on a Raspberry Pi is so, so easy. The developers have done a fantastic job with their pre-packaged image files that you can flash and be up and running in no time at all. In that previous segment, I set up the Pi 3 to run with my Cocoon Create Touch, but I also set up the Pi 0 to run with my Ender 3. For this video, the Raspberry Pi Model 3B is being used with an old Microsoft LifeCam Cinema, which is capable of 720p, and it's modestly positioned on top of an old container. The Raspberry Pi Zero is being used with an official Raspberry Pi camera, and that comes inside a nice little housing, which I'm holding up with a soldering helping hand. Now you might have noticed back on the installation screen that it warned that the Pi Zero didn't have the grunt to really make this work. So one of the purposes of this video is to find out how true that is. The Pi 3 tended to run everything quite well, but the Pi Zero definitely has latency issues when the camera is involved. Although it could run the printer, it was much slower to boot, install updates and log in and things like that. I'd say you could use it to check for that big disaster from afar, but it's not gonna be that usable day to day unless you like having lag from your camera. Now I did run a couple of time lapses using the built-in time lapse feature and they look not too bad. Camera quality aside, pretty much on par with the time lapses I would take in any other form. What we really want is to jump into Octolapse, which is a plugin for Octoprint. You might have seen the videos going around at the moment from Wild Rose Builds. They make super satisfying compilations using this technique. I'm certainly not up to that standard yet, but I'm going to keep on trying and my experiences are valuable for this video and showing you what you can expect. We need to come to our settings and then come into the plugin manager. The repository will come up and we can go to Octolapse and then click install and after a couple of minutes, we'll have that installed and ready to use. So after a short while, it'll say that your plugin is installed and prompt you to restart, which you should definitely do so you can start using it straight away. So if we switch to the tab for our new plugin, we can begin to set it up. First thing we need to do is to click a printer. This is the closest one for me. If we come to the settings, we can see what is set up here and I wouldn't recommend changing anything until you've done your first test print. Our stabilization is the point that the extruder will move to for the photo to be taken. We have a whole lot of presets and the first ones that I did were extruder at center, but eventually I settled on extruder at center left. Snapshot for the start, I set to layer change, which is automatically detected. The rendering applies to the video after the print is finished where it stitches all the images together and I kept it at 15 frames per second. But what I did was add a second before and after Therefore, when I'm editing my videos, it should be easier to slice up the clips. Now, if you open this camera one, you can test that it is in fact connected and we have success there. The main one you're gonna to need to change later on is the snapshot delay if you're having issues with your timing. We also have these things here which can flip and rotate if our camera is not orientated the way that we expect. Apart from that, what is recommended at the start is to put it on test mode which will not heat up the bed or the extruder and therefore not extrude any filament. It will just move around and take the photo and you can get a pretty good idea whether this is working or not. When it is working, you simply change it back to no logging. Another thing to note is that the normal time-lapse will be on unless you set it back to off. So unless you want two time-lapses per print, make sure you turn that off. So let's look at my initial results. Firstly, on one of my printers, I had a lot of trouble with the extruder being out of the way to time the photo exactly.
In my opinion, unless this takes place, the whole effect is wasted and it's really not that impressive at all. I experimented with the position and the speed in which the carriage was moved out of the way and I also experimented with the delay setting for the camera. These ones that you're seeing with no object there were done in test mode and it's a really good idea to do that until you got it dialed in. On the ones I did do with filament, the stringing was out of control because it's moving out of the way and sitting there for quite a long time. By the time the picture is taken and it's ready to move back, there's a big strand hanging on the end of the nozzle and as it comes back, it intercepts the print and gets stuck on the surface. It was difficult, but I was making ground, but the most significant step I made was by altering when the picture was taken. Let me talk you through it. But it was here that I decided to make it more reliable and control exactly when it tried to take the picture for the time lapse. So I did that by coming to script and then to the lay chain script and adding in G4 P5. What this does is add in a pause at each layer change of five milliseconds. So if you're printing outside of Octoprint and Octolapse, you're not gonna perceive any difference at all. So therefore it's a perfect command to put in. So to implement the snapshot being triggered by the G code, we simply need to change it to G code here. To tell it which G code is gonna trigger it, we need to click the gear and then come down to the bottom and where it says snap, we're gonna replace it with our G code, which is G4 P5. Now, every time it sees that, it's gonna know to take the photo and go through the sequence of moving it up and to the back exactly where we've programmed it. Well, that definitely helps, so it was time to get onto something harder. I chose this double helix model because I figured the two sides would look awesome as they spiraled around each other as the print rose from the ground up to the top. The first larger one that I did had nowhere near enough retraction and the blobs built up until eventually the print failed. It was looking pretty cool until that point at least. It seemed pretty clear that I need to put some time into developing my technique with this, but I thought I'd give it one last shot for this video. I scaled it down, tweaked my settings, and I almost got a good second print. The process was faster, so there's less stringing and blobbing, but ultimately there was enough to knock something loose right at the end of the print. I think it's a good idea that I play with my retraction, probably my Z lift, and even try moving it not as far away from the print each time to minimize the time that it has to ooze. In summary, I reckon Octoprint is awesome. I first used it several years ago when it was in its infancy, but now it's developed a long, long way. And besides Octolapse, there's a bunch of other great plugins to explore. I haven't even explored the convenience of using the inbuilt Cura engine to send it SDLs and have my G code produced automatically. Now onto the comparison of the two pies, and my pick has to be the Model 3B. It's the most powerful one you can get, and out of the box, all the functionality works exactly like you'd expect. I did eventually play with the settings on the config file for the camera, and that did decrease the experience because the lag for the camera feed got a lot, lot worse. I should also mention there's an app you can get for your phone to monitor everything conveniently on your home network. Now the Pi Zero was disappointing. It did work some of the time, but other times when some other process might have been running, the print quality was definitely affected. I noticed one time on the end of three that it was pausing for a couple of seconds at a time, and this left significant blobs on the surface of the prints. It's a real shame too, because the one that I have here has a really nice case where the Raspberry Pi camera fits inside and everything was very neat. It would look really nice on a 3D printed stand in front of the printer. I'd say as a workaround, if you operated this without the tab with the video feed open, you would get reasonable results, but really it's never gonna be as good as the other model. Hold on, update. There exists a plugin that moves the camera feed into a separate tab, and maybe it's worthwhile because I got this quite clean Octolapse using the Raspberry Pi Zero and the inbuilt camera when I didn't fiddle with the interface and it could run seamlessly by itself. Personally, I've been convinced that Octoprint is worth playing with just to give Octolapse a try. I'm gonna put a lot more time into this. I'm gonna do some research. I'm gonna find a webcam that works and works well. And I'm gonna try and build a rig that can move the camera from side to side to get the ultimate 3D printing time lapses. If you wanna see that, hit that subscribe button. Hopefully in the meantime, you've learned something from my experiences and my struggles. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.